Well, hello, friends. Welcome to another screen lecture of Marketing 1311. Today, we're going to look at analyzing the marketing environment and very closely doing a situation analysis, which is where you would begin a business plan, you'd begin a marketing plan. Anytime you're wanting to do something, we want to look at our environment that we live in and certainly that our business lives in and or a new product or a new service and so that is what we're going to do and this is one of your questions for your project one so let's dive into it the marketing environment you know there's there's many forces there's forces that hit our organization our product or service that hit yourself and so think of your company as you all right, or the company you work for or you wish to work for and these are the environments that, that, that play upon us. We have macro environments. <coughs> Pardon me. Economic environment, we have competitive, we have technology, we have social environments. And then we have some that just play right in on us as well. And this is going to be you know, uh, close to what the SWOT analysis was. So you have two tools now that you can use in your everyday career. And of course, I like this because I think most of you in this class are going to go for another job in life. You're, you're going to go for your professional job or promotion. And when you go to the interview process, and I have been a part of many interview committees uh, in my tenure here at the college and when I was in the private sector and I'm always amazed at the amount of information that a <clears throat> potential candidate does not do and they know very little about our organization and so if you are prepared with this type of uh, information you know research I think you'll do a very very good job and again when you get promoted through to new departments and to new jobs this is something that I think you can take advantage of. So, here we are. Here's the company. Now, this company could also be a product, okay, if you're rolling out a new product or a new service. So, we have customers, okay. Now, we kind of call this up in here the micro environment. And we say micro because we have a little bit of control over. Uh, and we should know our customers very well. Uh, we're able to market and, and target market we have collaborators okay and those would be organizations that work with us okay uh, those are also what we would also you know these are considered our stakeholders we have competitors and you say wow you know competitors kind of a micro environment because we, we we can learn a lot about them and, and when they move you know we can move or we can see where they're positioned and maybe we're not going to directly be competing with them. Then we have the climate. Now, so, so these C's right in here, and again, many other textbooks and uh, online areas will call this a 5C analysis, but we're really, it's the same thing, but we, I like to call it situation. That's what the book calls it. Again, we are we are analyzing the situation that we're in. And then here's the big macro things. What's happening in the macro world? What's happening in the global world? technology, political, societal world. So, let's flesh it out. All right, the micro environment, the company. So, if I've got my new position, I'm a new director, I'm a new department manager, etc., etc., marketing manager, I've got the company. So, I need to know everything about the product line. And again, knowing this going into an interview for one of your dream jobs would be fantastic. What's the image in the market? What's the technology and, and experience that we have? Again, uh, it aligns very, very close to the SWOT analysis that we talked about earlier. The employees, all right, our stakeholders. <clears throat> stakeholders, my friends, are any, I like to think of as anyone who can help or hurt you, okay, uh, in life. It's always good to know who your stakeholders are at work, uh, again, who they are in the workforce uh, and our personal stakeholders as well the capital the budgeting process decision making process culture goals 
everything about the organization I want to know about. And this changes, doesn't it? This is very, very dynamic. We also have collaborators, okay? Suppliers, we've talked about that earlier in the SWOT analysis. Yes, if I have a lot of suppliers, um, that means I can get my product very quickly or the materials that I need to perform my service or make my product. Uh, who's going to distribute it with the alliances we have. I mean, sometimes a competitor can be a collaborator too because, you, again, you may be selling different products. They may be able to help you as well uh, as long, you know, and, and not go direct head-to-head -head competition. Marketing intermediaries, those are just, you know, those are consultants. Those are anyone who can help you get that, uh, that product or that service to the customer. And that's what I like to think that anyone can help get that product to the marketplace. And again, that we are not limited to those bullet points. Anyone who's helping us, it, it, we're looking at that too as a collaborator. Who we who uh, who we do business with? Customers. Well, this is big. Again, uh, and in a situ now, situation analysis, you're kind of brainstorming everything together as, as best you can. So we want to look at the market size and growth of our customers. Okay, which which we will again look at much more closely as the course continues, because it's the market size. You know, let's just look at decades ago, Cadillac. Uh, now, Cadillac. If you were my era growing up, okay, that was a car that you bought at kind of the peak of your career towards the end of your career, but you're still peaking, you know what I mean? You had the money, woo, this meant you were very wealthy. Uh, you were probably in your upper 40s, 50s. It was an, uh, you know, almost always thought of an older person's car, that traditional generation that we'll look at here in a second, the traditionalists. But they were dying off. I say dying off, they, they, that was it. They bought that one big Cadillac and it was theirs. Uh, Cadillac said, you know, as the, as, as the baby boom generation is coming up and uh, we've got to look at our markets, so that's a huge market because the, they did not believe that their existing customer market was base was big enough to for long-term profitability. So they did some complete repositioning of their cars and that's why you have the XTS today and the um, Escalade and everything else. So we want to see how big is the market? Is there, an, is, there, is there enough piece of the pie to go around? The benefits of the customer, tangible, and what are their problems? We're solving customer problems. The motivation behind the purchase. Again, we want to get to that psychology. Why are you buying my product? Why are you using my service? Retail channel. Where is it coming from? So where do I, where do I start getting the information about this product or service? And how do I actually have that product or service delivered? Information sources. Again, where do we, where do we get that? Again, these are just big, big strokes right here, my friends. When we look at customers, as much as we should be, we should be tied to the hip, so to speak, with our customer, knowing her wants, she's looking at that car. Is she the only person that's going to make that decision, I wonder? You know, sometimes we think that this person right here, she may be the ultimate customer, but do you think her parents may have an idea? Maybe her father says, oh, no, no, you don't want to, uh, uh, you want to Ford. Yeah, I, I grew up with Ford automobiles. That's what you want. Can you afford this? Do you have the insurance? Uh, is it going to be safe? Mom wants to, wants to peak, her friends. So the process is an impulsive, is a comparable process of looking, of course, in a car, you probably are, but again, how many moving parts are in the decision-making process? I think we overlook that a lot in the marketing world, that it's just not this young lady who's buying that car. There's a lot of other people that are gonna influence her. How frequently do we make the purchase? Is this a consumable? Are we? Is our product gonna be bought on a weekly, daily basis? Or is it a big ticket item, like a car, that's maybe every three to five years? Quantity purchase, trends, preferences, acquisition costs, and that is how expensive are customers? My friends, customers are expensive. They're not free. And we'll look more of this again as we delineate this class. But always know that there's a lot of effort a personal salesperson, there's a shark looking at her right now, ready to come up and say, young lady, I've got the car for you. That's expensive, you know? So, interesting, interesting, our customers. Competitors, all right? What do we know about our competitors? Are the actual or potential competitors? 
Okay, interesting. Is it direct or indirect competition? Now you're saying, that's interesting, what does that actually mean? And uh, let's, let's take Starbucks. Now Starbucks is a dominant player in the coffee market, certainly the brewed coffee market. And so they may say, well, I got Dunkin' Donuts, all right, I got McDonald's. Man, I didn't realize how big McDonald's is to selling their, McCoff their McCafe, but it's huge. Okay, maybe there's the Roots Coffee, if you've ever been to Roots, there's one across from Northeast Campus, or they're kind of around really, really good places. And, you know, we could go to some, some, some different areas too, maybe Brahm sells coffee, that's probably getting in a little more indirect, but what about, uh, what about uh, your grocery store, Kroger? What about Whole Foods? Now, Whole Foods has a barista service inside. Is that direct competition with Starbucks? Well, if, if one's maybe, maybe more indirect. But what about the coffee on the shelves? Hmm, that's interesting, because that is coffee. It's not brewed yet, but uh, they would have to label that indirect. And in the coffee market, the largest growth in coffee, now coffee's been around since uh, literally a long time. I mean, we can go back to Ethiopia to see the uh, origins of coffee, but the time it got to the United States was really about the, t the founding of this nation, and I believe it was closer to the War of 1812, where we were a little bit upset at the British, and we stopped drinking tea and made coffee our national drink. And we drank a lot of coffee. I've already had three cups as I'm doing this video for you, and I got a cup in my hand. The largest market right now, the largest growth, is homebrew, okay? Your French press and the Keurig, uh, and of course a, a, a lot of different coffee machines. But that has seen something about like 20% growth a year versus the whole coffee market is about two or three percent growth per year. So yeah, gives you a little idea what a direct competitor is and an indirect competitor. The competitor's products, their positioning, their market shares, how big and small are they, the strengths and weaknesses. So I think you get the idea there. Imagine you went into an interview with all this information. You're going to get hired. Now, the climate. This is uh, those were the close players. The micro environment. This is the macro environment right in here. Uh, government. Does politics change? Yeah, absolutely, it does. Uh, you know the regulations that affect the market. Taxes. Political stability. You know, as uh, as wild as our nation is, it's still pretty stable. I mean, the left and the right fight each other. Uh, I'm an atheist in the sense of our political system, which I just think they're both on the same side, is what I really think. And they're not on a working person's side. That's just me. There we are. And so, but it's still stable. You know, we, we still have a stable system here. Now, is it pro or con big business? That's interesting. Yeah, it's been pro, it's been pro big business since Reagan. Okay, since that's the 1980s all the way through. I wish it was more pro small business. And so, you know, students, people like ourselves could open up a business or a side business and not get taxed hardcore and have easier levels of interest. But we know it's very, 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 very pro-big business. Economic environment, very important to look at. Types of economic system that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. We're a free market. But not all countries are, and so it may be difficult if you are in a position that needs to look at globalization and entering into uh, what may be called a closed economy, which may be more socialistic or uh, or the hardest, which would be communistic. But again, how much does the government play? Do you, do you have to go through government entities to even get your product or service onto the shelves of consumers in South America, in Africa, in, in, in Asia, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, the skill level of the workforce. Now, friends, this can also be done on a small basis. Okay, let's look at Dallas-Fort Worth. Absolutely. Our economic system, definitely. Uh, Texas, is, one of the great things about Texas is that we do not have a state income tax. Why so many organizations like to come here because when they offer their employees, I may not have to, I will certainly not have to pay as much for an employee in Texas, in Dallas, Texas, as I would in New York City. Okay, if anyone is from New York City, wow. I mean, so it, you know, let's let's look at pre-pandemic. It is an amazing place to live. It was an amazing place to live. Uh, but you got city. You have a city income tax. You have a state income tax and a federal income tax, and everything along the way is taxed. So, you know, a hundred thousand dollar income in New York City 
may easily equate a $60,000 income in Texas just because of so much taxes you have to have. And they also have property taxes very high in New York. So, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, very interesting. We want to look at that, the skill of the workforce in your area. Another reason Dallas-Fort Worth is one of the best economies in the United States, certainly in Texas, it goes to the United States, and, and maybe in the world, um, is because look at the colleges and universities we have between private and public and community college uh, there's no reason and, you know that every everyone has a has a an avenue to become skilled in the workplace inflation rate if it's high or low is how fast money is eroding growth rate consumer confidence again if your company's hiring well and you're prepared to see to get, to get a bonus and you know this has been a good year you have no problem going out and buying that sub-zero refrigerator and freezer set, you know, at about five to ten grand. Uh, you know, you have the confidence that, hey, I, I've got my job. Um, if you know the, the times that we're in right now during this pandemic, uh, many companies have not given raises, and and there's the fear of cutbacks and cutbacks uh, on from the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, all the way through, through you know, well, Amazon is doing very well, but but some pretty big businesses. You you may not want to go out and buy that new car. You may just say, you know, what we're going to do as a family, we're going to hoard our cash. Okay, we're going we're going to save it up, and because we don't know what the future holds, so confidence is huge in the economic environment. And of course, interest rate is just the price you pay money for, and right now it's very low, which can bring more people into different areas buying long term assets. Demographics. One of the fun things in marketing uh, is the study of people. And demography is traditionally, you find that in the field of sociology. But again, you can use your sociology degree, you can use your sociology training to work hand in hand in marketing. And there's literal degrees in demographics and in, in graduate degrees in marketing as well. What we're, we're looking at everything we're looking at population, human, density, location, age, race, gender, occupation. And we get down into micro. I mean, how much will someone pay for a certain product? Uh, interesting things we have. <clears throat> so we're changing. The family structure has changed dramatically in the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, geographic population shifts. Right now, you're going to see, what we're, and, and as we are in this very weird pandemic crisis, we're looking at about four to five states that will hold over 50% of the population, 50% of the population uh, in, uh, in the United States. And, it's, and that's changing as we speak right now because, you know, Texas, where we live, is growing. People are coming here for the reasons we just said. Florida is still growing. California is still huge. But other uh, areas that people retire out, you know, they, they want to move somewhere where their money goes further. So population shifts, educational characteristics. <clears throat> if your product or service is quite advanced, you may need someone with at least a college degree to understand it and, and to uh, and have the income to purchase it. So <clears throat> that's very important. Income levels, yeah, I'll be, we've done that forever. Population diversity, it goes on and on. Now, I like generations. <clears throat> so if we were just to kind of look at a few things, how many generations do we have? in the workplace right now because it is interesting we're working with about five generations so those of us who are full-time employed uh, this is what we're dealing with and of course as a marketer as a small business owner a manager uh, you know we, we want to know who's going to enjoy our products what do they like so let's take a little trip down generation lane now this is the traditionalists they were born from about 1920 to 1943 um, they are 11 million today, and they're declining. They were 35 million strong. These were the parents of the baby boomers. This was a generation that survived the Great Depression, and then many of them went right into World War II. And so they fought, and they defended, and they created, you know, this country in modern day. Now, my father and mother were parts of this. My mother's still alive. She's 90 years old, and she's in assisted living. We'll talk about here throughout this course. And so let's a little bit about them. Are they conservative? <clears throat> well, don't you think they'd have to be? If you were born into the Great Depression, where you may have gotten one meal a day, uh, yeah, nothing was ever thrown away. I can go into my mother's garage, which we are now, you know, in, in the process of a state sale. 
and we had to have professionals come in, but we're, we're finding stuff back from the 19, from, from the fifties that my mom and dad kept. I mean, because in World War II, there was a rubber drive for anything that was made of rubber, anything that was made of metal, anything that was made of plastic, uh, they recycled and, and figured out ways to reuse them. Work was a religion uh, to them. And that means you, you start work when the sun don't, hasn't shined yet, and you stop when you can't see it no more. It's just lots of work because they didn't have a job, you know, and, and, and families went together. Now, most are retired, but some are still working. You're saying, really? How's that possible? Well, they, they could easily be on boards of directors. They could still be on your city council. So they still have tremendous amounts of influence. They're very easy to market towards. They're very believable. Now, think about this. They have a lot of trust. They, you know, we're, we're talking their parents were probably in World War I, or certainly in that era, and then World War II. So this generation, you know, basically went to two world wars without even questioning it. And, of course, we had our other wars that we've had since then, and, and they were in power. We had Vietnam, Korea, uh, Gulf War, uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So... Yeah, very, very believing. And so they're easily scammed upon, too. Seniors are the number one being, you know, population that's scammed because they love to talk. And if someone calls them on the phone, that's how they get scammed the most and starts talking to them. Well, would you mind uh, uh, donating? Oh, sure. I, I'd be happy to donate to your organization. I just I like you so much. Will you call me again? That's, that's my mother. All right. They hold on to their wealth, all right, because they're so conservative. They, they did pack a lot of wealth. Very technology challenged. It's, uh, it's painful to watch them even turn the TV on anymore, isn't it? Damn it, I can't turn this thing on. Uh, I get a phone call from mom at least thrice a week. I said, well, it's that button that says power. You know, finally we have to get somebody to help her because they're not allowed to come out of the nursing homes during this time right now. Now, I also like to look at movies and heroes. Now, that right there, who's that guy with the hat, the cowboy hat? That's John Wayne. John Wayne was... Uh, just an iconic actor, hero, six foot four, big. Always played in a western, and uh, uh, made tremendous amounts of movies. But that, you know, if you have to kind of look at someone, the movie that that kind of binds a generation together was Casablanca. Again, it is on the right in World War One, right as America comes into the war. Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Bergman. Uh, it's a it's a it's a great movie. It is one of the few movies that has gotten I think a hundred percent as there's not not even a scene that's not worthy of of watching. If you've never watched it before, and you're sitting there, you know, because you're a little bit younger, and say, "What's this guy talking about?" Uh, get on iTunes, get on Amazon, get on Casablanca, and you'll see a lot about this generation, and it's, it gives you a world view because it's set in Casablanca, Morocco. So there are our traditionalists. Maybe they're your great-great-grandparents if you still have them. Maybe for some of us, like myself, who were kind of born later in life, they could still be your parents. Well, they had the baby boom, the children of the traditionalists. And so, right after World War II, you have a lot of uh, servicemen coming home, and life is getting back to normal, and so... Uh, we have this explosion of babies coming out right after 1946. Okay, that's basically right at the end of the war. Uh, World War II was 1945, the European occupation, and the Pacific uh, Theater ended in 1946. So 25% of the population. Uh, majority are at retirement age, which means they're in their 60s and their 70s right now. But uh, they're not retiring uh, huge, huge spenders. So, again, as you will see, uh, what their parents had to sacrifice through, uh, they were like, well, we don't want to sacrifice. We, we, we don't want to have one pair of shoes, as my mother said. She had one pair of shoes for like four years. And I said, well, didn't your shoes grow? Because this was, this was the uh, Dep Great Depression, and it was during the war. Uh, she said, I wore my mother's shoes, and then my sister wore my shoes. I mean, we, we, we never threw anything away. This generation said, no way, I want it. So they don't going to retire because they're spending a lot of money, and they enjoy working. Their, their job is not a religion as much as it is something that they just enjoy. Uh, they are expecting this. If uh, their mother's in nursing homes like mine, and 
evaporating all the inheritance, uh, they are, are expecting the largest transference of wealth from parents. Because as that traditionalist who have saved and saved and saved uh, expire, uh, they're taking the money and running. This has been happening for the last uh, about 20 years. Uh, some people say, all right, uh, that they may have ruined the economy for future generations. And I, I, I say that because this generation still gets to retire. They still get the maximum self-security. Uh, for those of us who are not in that baby boom generation, uh, we're going to have to work a lot longer. And so stay healthy. Stay healthy. Technology for uh, this generation is a necessary evil. We can deal with it. We, they, they can do it. Um, but they're certainly not as savvy as younger generations. Their movie would have been The Big Chill. Okay, again, that's kind of this movie pretty much set off the baby boom generation. It was like in 1980s when it came out, and those were the big actors during that time. And they pretty much said, you know, this is who we are, our coming out movie. Well, then we have Generation X, more of my generation. We were born in either the middle to late 60s to 1979. We were a smaller 40 generation. We're called a we're less materialistic. Uh, now, we were the first generation that was raised on TV. Again, uh, baby boomers really weren't. It was much more radio that they were raised on. But we were as latchkey kids, man. We were Sesame Street. And I say latchkey kids. There was no such thing as daycare. I mean, daycare was like, what? Uh, didn't your mom or dad or did your mom, you know, take care of you? That, that was it. We had a, a lot of, most of the kids growing up, uh, my mom was always at home. But if they were gone, if they had to do something different, women were coming into the workplace in the middle uh, 1970s and, and then just took off after that. But there's your latch key. And that just meant you ran home from school, you figured out where the key was because mom or dad hid it, you got inside, and then you locked yourself inside. Uh, until mom came home from her errands, shopping, or mainly from work. Uh, because the 1970s was a terrible decade of recessions. Uh, so, very cynical because this generation has seen so much on TV to know that, you know, that's really not real. Uh, we're sandwich generation. We're sandwiched in, we have the baby boomers below us, and we have the millennials above us, and those are two giant, I mean, these are 80 million apiece generations. And also, we are providing the care for our parents and children at the same time. That's when you're really sandwiched in. Oh, it's a lovely life to have that. Taking care of mom and dad and your own children. Uh, and zing, that's what you got. This, this was the first, we're the first generation that really embraced technology because we, we, were, we, we saw it being created. The first Apple computer came out, I think, in 1980. Uh, well, actually, 1976 was the first Apple, and it got, it got commercialized in the, in the early 80s. And so certainly have been embracing it. The Breakfast Club, I'm sure you've heard of that. Uh, 30th anniversary, <laughs> say it ain't so. Okay, it was still a great movie. Again, it kind of symbolized that Generation X right in there. Who's after this? The Millennials. Hello, my name is Millennial. This is kind of the 1982. And it depends on where you're born in a generation. If you're born in a cusp year, like, like right at the beginning, you know, like for instance, my parents were traditionalists, my brothers and sisters were all baby boomers, and then I was like, whoa, who do you, what's this kid coming along for? We're all in our teens, and here comes Randy. Yeah, uh, you may be like that. And so you may identify with both generations or one to another. And so uh, typically uh, the millennials go to 1999. Some have it pegged at 1995. Doesn't matter. 83 million, very strong. Could be the largest generation population wise. This was daycare kids. So mom is really in work. These are baby boomers now having children maybe a little bit later in life or, or uh, uh, the younger baby boomers are. And so the daycare is now something that has to be done. So they're very sharing, you know, for the most part, if they will, if they, uh, uh, were raised in a daycare area, the independent-minded, socially-minded, and accepting. Technology is a way of life, obviously. And now, as the millennials, probably, you know, the younger millennials are like 25 because the, you know, the generations up above 26, inheriting a lot of the sins of the parents, the sins of the father, so to speak. And that is a humongous national debt. And it's going to soon be $30 trillion. Now, I can remember Ronald Reagan saying, I was very young when he said this, 
we are leaving debt to our children and to our grandchildren, to our great grandchildren, uh, because we were spending so heavily in the 1980s. Um, that's what he was talking about. He was talking about you, uh, or, or, or whatever we are. You know, if you're in that group, uh, you are the children and, and, and I would say grandchildren, great grandchildren. Reagan talked about, and that was one trillion dollars. We thought one trillion was way too much debt, and back in like the middle to late 80s. And here we are on the on the cusp of thirty trillion unemployment, huge student loans. Oh my gosh, my friends, uh, uh, take every single course you can at Tarrant County College before you move on. Save the money uh, and, and do what it takes to get that bachelor's degree with very little debt. Gen Z, maybe a lot of you are in Gen Z, born somewhere around two thousand to twenty fourteen. It's kind of the uh, the area we're looking at 85 million this really really spiked certainly around 2010 uh, coming of age is this year and next year 2021 2022 40 percent will be consumers so it's going to grow you know the uh, uh, we're looking at 20 years old right now as the as the upper limit to uh, gen z and maybe 22 again you, you may have been born in the very late 90s uh, this generation gets a lot, $44 billion in allowances. So again, in the marketing world, when you look at this generation, so, whoa, first of all, do you have any spending power? You do. Well, now we're going to market towards you hardcore. So $600 billion influence on family spending. We're going to look at that in unit two there. You know, uh, when you bring your children shopping with you, you will spend a whole lot more than if you left them at home or or are playing with somebody else. So interesting. I like this. Seventy percent would like to turn hobbies into businesses. So uh, they have a kind of entrepreneurial spirit there, and they're not uh, technology uh, embrace. They're not race. Uh, they are addicted. Okay, and again, they may, may be you, but certainly. Certainly those born like 2010, think of that. Think of those born after 2007. 2007 was the iPhone. Okay, so the first real smartphone came out. So many of these children born 20, 2008, 9, 10, 11, all the way through 14, uh, basically had an iPhone in their hands maybe since uh, a month old or, or at least six months old where they had some dexterity. So uh, if you've ever taken a phone away from one in, a person in this generation, it is not pretty. You You may... You may come out bruised. Uh, so, huge potential, uh, huge online potential. Again, online sales were very small, but before March of 2020, uh, we're seeing that completely erased right now. But maybe this generation, everything they do is going to be online. Is there anyone else? Yeah, the alpha generation. We've gone through the alphabet uh, in generations, and this is again, this is from marketing and deep think tanks. So we're going into the Greek alphabet now. So we have alpha, those born from 2015 to 2030. So if you have a very young brother or sister or young child under five years old, this is their generation. Population is growing. Uh, this generation will grow up with artificial intelligence. So that's going to be very interesting, isn't it? Tech savvy, that's just an understatement. That They'll know nothing but uh, kind of like the young Zs, but even more so of, the, uh, of a high-tech environment. Okay, probably, probably have a lot less human contact than previous generations because everything they do will be online. And uh, they're being very coddled, okay, by an influence. Again, they may, this, this, this may be millennial parents, all right? Definitely, their first child uh, could be Gen X. Could be very late Gen X, sometimes, or I should say, a very you know different family. Maybe it's the second or third go around. And as I've heard it said so many times, you know, we we, we screwed our first kids up, and even my, my second set of kids, uh, maybe different marriages. This one I want to get right, so they get a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount of attention and resources. So. I hope you enjoyed that trip down Generation Lane. Where do you think your company that you work for, what generation uh, is that target market? Interesting, yeah? Uh, that's how you can use this information. Broad strokes here in Generations, but I think you can say, hey, let's start with uh, our customer. Let's at least start with Generation. They're going to figure out a lot of the preferences that they have grown up 
and that they like and, and what really motivates them and influences them. In the situation analysis, we look at the social, cultural environment, society's trends in fashion, yeah, education, attitudes towards health, conscious, etc. If you were to put this picture up in the mid 1970s throughout the 1980s, this would say, hey, nice, this is a snack. Today, this may be your dinner. Uh, we're very much more health conscious. If I was going to open up a food truck, if I was going to open up a, a restaurant or give any advice, uh, I would say veganism may not be a fully vegan restaurant, but boy, you sure need a, a menu, a side of a menu, being health conscious vegan. Uh, because we were taking much better care. It's, it's, a, it's a giant attitude in everything we do, not just in food and, and how we maintain, buy our clothes. Uh, the list goes on and on. So what is the beats of society? Again, you can go a lot more than those four bullets. You, you, you can uh, have a, literally uh, a whole course in that. The technological environment. New knowledge, satisfying needs, you know, this is ever-changing, ever-growing. Equipments that are outdated, new technology, and of course something that I think you ought to keep on your radar and study is something called disruptive technologies. Again, I've talked about this, I believe, in the SWOT analysis, but this is where something that comes in, a, a, new, a new technology, <clears throat> new innovation, and it goes a whole different way than anyone else thought it would. And so, again, we look at what the internet has done in the last 25 years. We can look at what batteries have done, these lithium batteries that, have, that were made just to be, you know, hey, a better, uh, a better battery that now you can put them and literally run outdoor landscape equipment and you don't need uh, all that gas and oil in your old lawn mowers and edgers and weed eaters. And so, but that wasn't what it was supposed to do. It was this supposed to be a better battery or, or better technology. Of course, flash memory. You know what flash memory has done and all of a sudden what it did to the photography business okay you used to be able to have a really good job as a photographer because you were developing and really you know manipulating the film to where now you've got a seven-year-old be able to work photoshop so disruptive technologies can they come and affect your department your business idea your organization and again how can we be able to harness that technology Globalization in the situation analysis, yeah, or, you know, again, distribution channels, the accessibility, marketing to different cultures is not an easy thing, the exchange rates and currency, uh, global catastrophes. Don't you think we have to think about this? Absolutely. And how many companies were had this on their forefront? I mean, this is the fifth pandemic in 20 years in this millennium and each one has become different and this one obviously has become the worst as far as being contagious uh, we're no closer than we were six months ago to uh, it seems to me to uh, behaving differently at least did that mess with the global supply chain does that have to be changed you know I, I had I was very naive I knew a lot of technology and equipment was made in Asia. I didn't think most of our pharmaceuticals came from Asia. And so there was a huge stop in the supply chain for the first months. Oh, is that going to have to change? I think so. You know, again, right now delays in shipping. Uh, if you purchase on eBay more than you should, like I do, uh, I've noticed that if something's coming from California or even from New York right now, it's three or four weeks before I get it, uh, and it's stuck somewhere in a distribution center, and those distribution centers are coming, becoming somewhat uh, chaotic themselves. So the workforce, who's able, who's essential, who's non-essential, uh, who has the technology to work from home, friends, I, I believe that this pandemic has shot us about 10 years into the future, at least, and we would have been commuting and working a lot, commuting less, working a lot more from home and by the year 2030. So it's, it's put us up there. Do we have the tools? Do you, is your internet speed fast enough? You know, uh, do you have the capability of, in, of an equipment and the skills to work at home versus working 
in for an organization because as organizations see this, um, it's a lot less cost for them to not have to have a building, to not have to have all the uh, supplies that you normally had uh, in a traditional workforce. So this is this is not going away. What it's done to us. So you know, again, who gets to survive and who thrives during massive amounts of change? I thought I'd do a quick situation analysis, and again, just to briefly, um, the company Apple, and this is a, a, a very brief one, okay? We could, you, you could make this a whole course. But if we look at Apple, it's considered to be, you know, this is the image, it's the most innovative company that we have, a uh, consumer electronics company, we'll put it that way. Uh, their name recognition, I, I probably don't have to tell you about Apple, that they were a computer company, and now they're consumer electronics, you know that. Tremendous sophistication in their product line. As far as the strength of an organization, their earnings, an all-time high was in June 2014, at least their stock price, was six forty-five, and they split it. They did a seven-for-one split. Actually, it got up to $700 a share. And so it went to $101 a share. I just checked it a couple of weeks, uh, last week. It's four eighty-nine today. And in 1993, four, five, Apple was left for dead. The company was at three dollars a share, and nobody wanted to even touch Apple. And that's when Steve Jobs came back, and and uh, Bill Gates himself put a billion dollars into the company to give it the capital it needed to start getting innovative again. Don't you wish your parents, and don't you wish myself would have bought it that just a thousand shares at three dollars a share? That's not too much. Anyhow, uh, $261 billion in sales last year, 19, in 2019. $5 billion in 2002. That was their total sales in 2002. And we thought in 2002, this is a giant company. Well, it's now a behemoth. It's a trillion dollars worth of net worth. Maybe the, the highest valued company in the world. I think it is. And they're, they're, you know, between Google, between uh, Apple, between Amazon. Uh, they were huge, huge, and they were only worth ten billion eighteen years ago. So tremendous amounts of growth. If we just kind of look at where their sales are coming from, they're very diversified. Most comes from right in here, uh, the your your iPhone is still fifty percent, and then of course here's some of the other things that they sell. But uh, their uh, uh, three percent was just other twenty percent is from your iPads. And of course, I don't even think we have, yeah, we do, right in here, iTunes, 9%. The rest, this is where their money comes from. Only 35% from North and South America. Europe, China, Asia, of course, uh, very big. So, interesting. Competitors, if we were to throw a few out there, we'd call, uh, I mean, who competes against Apple? Samsung, of course, Samsung and Apple to fight each other in the daytime. But they're, they're pretty cozy in the evening. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that soon. Microsoft, uh, online, I, you know, uh, the, the cloud storage systems, P2P fair sh uh, file sharing, that's where iTunes came in and really, really beat that down. And, of course, uh, Google, you know, is, is, its domination of Internet may, may be the end game for the very, very, very big high-tech players. Uh, collaborators, all sorts China is a huge collaborator. That's where at least the products. And China and Asia. We we all think that uh, China gets every bit of Apple, but they really don't. There's a lot of different Asian companies, uh, countries that that have that, and then, of course, still the United States is gets the bulk out of every Apple uh, phone. I believe it supports at least two hundred and fifty dollars per phone uh, of their profit. Uh, goes, goes to the United States. Again, the supply chain moved to Asia in the early, in the late 1990s, in the early, early aughts. So there are reasons these giant companies are there. That's just where all the supply chains are, the semiconductor groups, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, Samsung's still a big collaborator because they make a lot of the chips for Apple, the other processing chips. Rare earth elements, the largest holder of rare earth elements are in is in China. And these are these very hard to pronounce metals that can take tremendous amounts of tolerances in their heat and heat to cold uh, that we literally had to find those on our space endeavors as we go to uh, as the uh, space shuttle 
technology came from, and that's why we get these nice, beautiful phones that can tolerate what a basically a giant computer could do. I think all the computing power that NASA had in 19 for the first Apollo mission is in your iPhone or your Samsung Galaxy. Pretty interesting. The customers, if you are an Apple customer, traditionally it's not happenstance. They are extraordinarily loyal. The reason Apple made it through the days of the early 90s when Michael Dell said, leave Apple for dead, was because the customers, the desktop designers, the graphic designers said, no, 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 that we will defend Apple every bit of the way. We've got to have this product. And so, uh, again, they wouldn't, their organizations would not, they wouldn't work on a PC. They said, you got to get us the Apple if you want the work done right. And so that is helped, that brought the company through the very, uh, pit of the abyss, uh, 100 billion dollar, 100 billion in downloads of apps, well over that. Uh, you know, I mean, every uh, uh, of online music comes from iTunes, 90%. It's amazing. We could go on and on and on about the customers. The climate, yes, it's big business. Uh, we, we talk about tax increases. We're going to talk about uh, import taxes coming in from China. It's never happened yet. Uh, of course, I'm sure they look at their patents, their copyright law, the piracy, the future internet, regulations, economic. Hey, right now, consumer confidence, uh, I would say it's lower than the middle of the road. Uh, is there a middle class uh, or are y'all just working? Consumables may go down, but will we continue to pay over a grand for the newest iPhone and all the service? Uh, well, their sales have been strong this year, so, so far, the answer is yes societal you know uh, is your phone just a phone or is it a fashion statement um, when iTunes came on in the year 2000 there was something else out there called Napster and uh, it was illegal peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and uh, the guy was a uh, um, he, he may have been at Harvard but he was a college dropout he was just got too bored with college but in his dorm room he figured out ways to share music without having to pay anything for it. Now again, this was in the inception when music was going do digital to CD. It was already there, but but to start putting it online into MP3 and MP4 um, type of formats was, was pretty new. And so Napster came out, and just a quick gloss over what they were doing and the power Napster had. If someone was, if a company was trying to do the downloads and the file sharing that Napster had, it would have cost a company $25 million a month in the year 2000. Now that meant something, you know, near 2000, $25 million. And of course you had to have just tremendous, which meant you had tremendous power to push all this data across the United States. That's mainly where it was coming from. Uh, at least the file sharing was. And that's who did it for free. I mean, it was basically no cost at all to them. They had, when, it, when you start sharing everything, uh, well, the first copyright infringement suits came out, and I think one, they finally, they finally, Justice Department, which was probably paid very high, heavily by the recording industry, uh, had one young, one uh, lady who had basically 65 songs that they traced, that they knew they traced, they had all the information that were illegally shared, and the verdict was, was something like $10 million. It was crazy. Obviously, she did not pay that amount, but they just sent the message, we are going to nail you, and we're going to sue the companies you work for if this was done on company equipment. So, all of this is dark clouds are in the air, and people are doing this, and Apple buys this uh, iTunes, it wasn't called iTunes, they, just, they, they bought this for their new product called the iPod, and the iPod is what sent Apple into space, basically. This is what uh, carried over so well for them. And they redid this business into iTunes, where you could basically buy any song you want for 99 cents, or you lose your job by, by illegally doing it. And so uh, it, again, certainly caught lightning in a bottle, so to speak, because uh, Apple iTunes just blew up. And there's something always, my friends, about being first in the market. Uh, they were first in the market. It took Google, uh, it seems like uh, a decade or two to do Google's uh, songs. It took Amazon a long time. To Microsoft, well, just the Microsoft, I don't know if they ever even did a song. Oh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. They had their Zoom player. That was great. 
And so huge, huge step for Apple right in here. Uh, the societal fear of losing a job by doing the file sharing or just going on and, and getting iTunes for 99 cents. So is your device a part of your identity? You know, more than likely it is. If, if you lose your phone, do you panic? I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I don't know where my phone, I don't know where my wallet is, but I don't know where my phone is because the phone can be so much to everything. It, might, it can be my transportation, I can Uber, uh, it can be my food because all I have to do is order and have it delivered and I can pay right on it. So, yeah, yeah, that is our identity. Globalization is that not, I mean, some of what Apple has done just with iTunes itself, it's the perfect global product because it, it's just digits, my friends, and it can be downloaded anywhere. All different things that Apple has to look at. Of course, yeah, uh, we put in here the global pandemic again. Uh, most of there is, is the Asian supply chain right now. Is that gonna change? Because there was a while, there was a time, I think for 30 days, that Apple could not release their new Apple uh, 10 uh, or the 10 update or the X, whatever you want to call it, because uh, we were everything had stopped shipping from China. So, and major delays, and the workforce is as the workforce gets very sick, and can the workforce be able to do things that, in, in isolation and still keep the company going? Of course, technology comes up, disruptive technologies. iTunes is one of the perfect e-commerce products. That's artificial intelligence. Should be at full throttle in 2025. Uh, wow, wow, are, are we preparing ourselves for that? Because this could be another, it's gonna be a huge disruption in, in the workforce, I believe, too. Uh, again, you can just Google up YouTube, a a Amazon's robots, and, and look what they do. And these are going to be much, much, much more sophisticated because it has deep learning involved in it. Wearable computing is a huge disruption right now. And Apple's, you know, I mean, who can take advantage of that in the next five years? It's a trillion dollar market beyond the watch. You're looking at all sorts of stuff that's going to come through. Future trend, Internet of Things, great subject to research. Anything and everything is being connected to the Internet. Now, we said by 2020, this was done a few years ago. Um, maybe we missed that mark just because of, of the delays we've had in the pandemic. But it's coming. Uh, so much is here. And so with all that, can Apple continue to grow? Absolutely. So I hope, my friends, that this has given you a little insight of a situation analysis. Uh, I think you can answer that question better. But not only that, I think it's something that you'll use throughout your career. Uh, again, take that information to a, your professional interview of the job that, that, uh, that you want so much and blow them away with the research you've done. You've got that new job as a new department manager, as a new director, uh, for whatever it is. Uh, do that quick situation analysis com com Combine that with a SWOT analysis uh, for that side, even for your side business, absolutely for that, because that side business that you may think of growing and starting can grow into a full-time business and maybe even grow into something larger than that. So, hope that's very helpful. Uh, again, read through your uh, Analyzing the Marketing Environment chapter and answer those questions. And above all, my friends, make it a great day.